Travis, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, sure. So Travis Dickinson, and I, uh, I guess my primary role is I teach philosophy at Dallas Baptist University. Um, also write books. And um, I was going to flash my newest book, but I didn't have it ready, apparently. But just had this one come out, Wandering Toward God and Finding Faith Amid Doubts and Big Questions. And hopefully that uh, endears me a little to your um, audience. Uh <laughs> And I, I assume you've got a mixed audience, but at least some in the audience that um, because I'm saying in the book that we should doubt, uh, it's OK to doubt and that there's value in, in doubting our faith. And now I think faith, you know, Christian faith provides um, good answers, but nonetheless, I think that it's a good thing to, to doubt. So that's what the book is about, wandering toward God. Um but I also uh, speak and, and uh, as I said, write and, um, and cr you know, Christian. I, I hold to the historic uh, claims of Christian faith. And, and yeah, it's one of the most important things of my life. Cool. So I am an atheist, by which I mean, I believe that there's no evidence that indicates the existence of God. I think that everything is best explained by naturalism. Could you tell me some of the reasons you believe there are for belief in a God and specifically Christianity? And I'd like to hear your thoughts on my interpretation of those. Yeah. So um, I I come down to it in, in a particular way. I'm sure you've, you've debated all these particular ways. So I, as I was reflecting on the drive here, and I should say too, I, I don't, uh, I, I have caught your videos here and there, um, but I don't know a lot about you. So I do hope to, to sort of get to know your views a bit better than that. Cause what you said there could go a lot of different directions as, as mine could as well. So, um, but uh, you know, so I thought just as I was thinking about how to, how to go this morning, I was thinking that, you know, to kind of go in a, a bit of a unique route. Um, for me, I think that uh, I, I've really come to the place where I think that um, naturalism may not make sense at all. <laughs> like it may not be, uh, you, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the distinction between um, metaphysical possibility and logical possibility. So it's clearly logically possible. It's clearly not a straight contradiction to say and again this is where you can feel free to fill in any <clears throat> excuse me uh details um for your particular brand of naturalism but um it's you know the the typical sort of statement of naturalism i think is is coherent logically coherent but i'm not sure i'm kind of come to this place where i think it may not be metaphysically coherent uh, or metaphysically possible. And what I mean by that is, and, and I should say too, that when I uh, heard someone say this kind of thing early on in my journey, excuse me, <clears throat> I, uh, I thought it was crazy too, probably the way you're thinking of it right now too. But um, as I really reflected on it, I, I, I think that it, it makes some sense. And it's actually a pretty good starting place to talk about these issues because the typical arguments and, you know, sort of features of reality that we look to to um, come to the conclusion that God exists um, sort of flow out of this statement. And so uh, here, here's the kind of idea is that when we think about the natural world, when we think about, again, just kind of what it is as we find it, um, right? I'm not sure. I, I think I, I'm convinced that it needs a metaphysical ground. I'm convinced that uh, there has to be some foundation, something uh, a, a, that, that sort of, um, yeah, I guess the word would just be that grounds its reality. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, just natural properties all the way down at the end of the day makes sense in that way. So we need something. And so, you know, the, the short of it, 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 this is a quite ancient, of course, um, claim going all the way back to the pre-Socratics, where if you look at the pre-Socratics, they sort of, uh, you know, they just tried everything. It was sort of what can be, you know, it could be water, it could be, uh, you know, fire, you know, all, all these various things that could be the sort of uh, foundation of reality. But I think the thing that makes most sense to me is that there's a mind 
that is transcendent, that that grounds all of reality and, and makes it in a way a necessary, um, right? It has to, has to be this sort of like necessary existent. Um, and you just don't have a lot of options at that point. Maybe something like mathematical facts or logical facts would be these sort of necessary truths at least, but but whether or not those can ground reality, I'm just not sure. Um, God's for me fits the bill. So the, my first question is metaphysics is essentially just understood as the fundamental nature of reality. And so metaphysical naturalism is the position that na nature is um, metaphysics. So I wouldn't I disagree that there has to be a metaphysical grounds of reality. I, I totally agree. Metaphysics is, there has, this is what existence is. Ontology is a branch of metaphysics. So obviously there has to be some metaphysical existence, but I don't see why it couldn't be natural. No, I'm saying why... that the natural world needs this sort of metaphysical grounding. That, that was the claim. Sorry. Right. But I don't understand why the natural world can't be the metaphysical grounding, because one of the most prominent views is metaphysical naturalism. So nature is the metaphysical grounding. So metaphysics is just the fundamental nature of reality. Whatever that is, it's metaphysics. So yes, I agree. There has to be a metaphysical grounds. But why not? Why think that's more than natural? Yeah. Yeah, because um, when you think about and this is where, again, you get to the arguments, you know, the more classical arguments, uh, Aquinas's five ways and, you know, all the way through to Bill Craig's Col Kalam cosmological argument and so on. You get all these features that don't seem to be um, metaphysically foundational. Right. So you have the natural world is a world of contingency, a, a world of. You know, again, just think of all the various uh, cosmological arguments. Uh, it's a, it's a, the natural world is a, a world in motion, a world in flux. It's changing. Uh, it's finite. Uh, uh, you know, especially you know if, if that's. And again, I'm not saying you would necessarily grant all these properties, but it, but these seem to be pretty plausible. And a lot of people think that these are features of the natural world. And the claim would then be these can't be metaphysically foundational. There needs to be something that grounds these kind of things. Like the finite, the finitude of the of the universe, of course, is uh, one that a lot of apologists talk about and philosophers. Um, right? That would be take that just as an example. It's uh, to say. Finitude Sorry? as in the no past infinite regression finitude? Because yeah, like I that. think the consensus is that the universe is infinite in physics, both temporally and spatially. Um, I don't know if that's consensus, but again, we can we can pick any of these. Doesn't doesn't need to be one that everybody agrees with. Um, right, right. So, so my general question yeah. to you would be, is what is an example of something you think is better explained by um, non-naturalism? The contingency of the universe. Um, why do you think the universe is contingent? Um, I think I would go from something. I, I mean, it, it seems it seems plausibly contingent. I guess I'd start there to say that that that's the way it seems. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's it didn't. It, there's no necessity that attaches to it. So, I mean, I, th I think this, again, kind of comes back to how we um, make these distinctions, of course, of how we get to anything's being necessary or contingent. And I think, I, I guess I would just say that when we look at the universe, um, it exhibits all the properties of contingency. Um, so like, why would the necessary being be a God as opposed to a quantum field? Well, um, because I think it doesn't ultimately ground, um, the features that we find. So here, here again, we sort of get back into the features of it. Um, something like the, you know, so I, I guess, let me, let me back up a little bit even more when I, when I kind of go from my epistemological approach, it's going to be something like Descartes. I, I'm going to start Descartes with something like, I, I, uh, you know, if I start to kind of go hit to his project where I doubt everything that I could possibly doubt, what I realize is that I can't doubt that 
I exist and then that I'm a thinking thing. Um, and that, and then I begin to notice features and this is where I sort of depart from Descartes, but, um, that, that would be the fundamental starting place epistemologically uh, I is that I exist as a thinking thing. And then I start to consider my sort of phenomenal experience and so on. So that makes, I mean, we're already probably outside of the natural world there um, because I, I don't think that conscious experience exhibits, th it falls neatly at least cleanly within the natural uh, world category. I don't quite understand that argument because uh, any phenomenon that exists or that we experience would fall into a category of the known stuff or the unknown stuff. And the known stuff, the natural stuff is in the known stuff category. And the unknown stuff doesn't have a category. It's just the unknown stuff. And so if consciousness would either fall into the category of the natural stuff, where it would be known, or it'd be the unknown, which could just also be a form of unknown natural. And so it would naturally be able to fit into the category of natural because there's no reason for it not to. Simply saying that none of the known natural things have the property of qualia experience or something doesn't imply that qualia experience is not natural. It'd be like saying, um, affirming the consequent that um, we don't know of any examples of a blue object, therefore blue cannot be it's not the case. The fact that we don't know of any doesn't mean it's not natural or it's not the case. So why assume that consciousness isn't an unknown natural thing? Simply, yeah. Because... What do you mean by natural? Maybe, maybe that'd be helpful to, for you to say what you mean by natural. Then, because it sounds like if it's just what is known, then yeah, of course the consciousness will fall within uh, the natural category. But it, it surely can't just be what is known. Oh, so I'd say it's unguided physical forces, so not things guided by a mind. So my matter and energy and motion is what I'd call natural. And I'd contrast that uh, supernatural, would, which would be a non-physical mind guiding stuff, something along those lines. Yeah, so your mind then, your conscious experience, seems to me with that definition, would fall within the supernatural. Because it's you are guiding, your mind is guiding... Uh, your thoughts and your your volitions and your decisions and things like that. Well, I think it's physical. So I'd say non-physical consciousness would be like the supernatural, whereas physical consciousness would not be. I'd put that in the natural category. Yeah. Why, why think it's physical, though? Mm, because of all the inductive evidence of physical things we have that exist in the world. And so it seems like uh, given the fact of how we know about physics, goes into chemistry and chemistry goes into biology biology goes into brains and brains seem to produce consciousness and we have no examples of consciousness that exist outside of brains and interacting with brains seems to have a phenomenally profound effect on consciousness and not the other way around seems to infer that the primacy of matter as opposed to consciousness and that consciousness is an emergent property of matter yeah so what's the inductive evidence for the physical though that was what you started with um, inductive, inductive evidence for the physical. I'm not sure what you mean. That's what you said. So that's why I'm just asking you to clarify. I, well, I had like, said, what's your, what is the, what are the reasons to think that it's physical? And you said the inductive evidence of all the physical. Um, so, so like the physical world around us is, is a hypothesis and it makes testable predictions and those testable predictions are confirmed, which is evidence that it's real. Yeah. But so, what, what would be the reason to think that it's physical? Uh, because other than what, you know a, a uh, phenomenal well that's what the hypothesis states so you can state anything you want in a starting hypothesis and if that hypothesis makes predictions and those predictions are true you then have evidence to believe the hypothesis okay so what's what the, I, mean, I don't mean to and we don't need to get completely bogged down on this point but i'm just not hearing any uh you know reasons to think that it is physical therefore I mean, so are you just saying that that's your starting place, that that's a sort of assumption you're making that when no. we have conscious experience of the world that you take, you know, say you're standing in front of a tree, you have visual experience of a tree, that's that's your conscious experience. And then you are inferring from that that the physical world exists. No, evidence for me is the ability to accurately predict the future. So if you have a hypothesis 
magical sky pixie named Bob created the world five minutes ago. And if you have this hypothesis and that hypothesis can predict the future experiences better than any other hypothesis, then the fact that you are able to predict future experiences more accurately with this hypothesis than the other is reason to believe any of the assumptions in that hypothesis. So I and can so make any, physical... any hypothesis I want, whatever, whatever, whatever things you want. Um, yeah, yeah. God created 6,000 years ago. Right. If he did, the Bible says X, Y, Z. Yeah. And if those things happen, it's reason to believe everything in the Bible, no matter how ridiculous. So, but I guess what I'm saying is how, how do we, how do we know that the physical exists over and above something like the evil demon? Well, again, it's the, it's the novel testable prediction. So if I, if I have a hypothesis, there's an evil demon and a hypothesis, I'm in the real physical world. And one of these allows me to infer future information that I get correctly. Whichever one does that, I'm justified to believe. And so how would it do that better than the evil demon hypothesis? Because that's that's the kind of trick. I mean, not trick, but that's well, in the, my mind, that's the, one of that's them does, the one of them doesn't. So in my mind, one of them does, one of them doesn't. And that's what makes one of them justified and one of them not. So if in your mind, it was the other case, the other would be justified for you. So it's simply the fact that if you have a hypothesis that allows you to predict the future, whatever that is, you are justified in believing it. It isn't proof. You don't need infallible knowledge, but it right, gives right, you a justification. Right. No, I agree. But what what... I don't mean to keep pressing it, but what um, what is the prediction that makes the hypothesis that the physical world exists successful over and above that the evil demon is giving me all these experiences? Um, I hypothesize there is a physical world. And because I hypothesize there is a physical world, when I touch my PlayStation controller, it will turn the PlayStation on. When I touch the PlayStation controller, it does turn the PlayStation on. I am now justified in believing I'm in the physical world. Oh, okay. So it's just a matter of... So, I mean, it could be anything. It could be... Well, I'd go with science, I mean, technically. You're, yeah, not, be, you're not seeing... So is it justified... Is it justified to a de greater degree than, say, the evil demon hypothesis? Yes, because the evil demon Why? hypothesis does not make successful predictions in my mind. When, when you say in your mind, what do you mean? Uh, it means like when I compare the two hypotheses and try to use them to infer things about the future, one of them allows me to do that. One of them does not allow me okay, to do that. Great. So how, how does it not, how does the evil demon hypothesis fall short? Um, because in my mind, the evil demon does not allow me to predict the future. I do not have a not? cognizant model of the evil demon that works to predict the future. Uh, see, I mean, th I think that's Descartes point in a lot of ways is that, when you're thinking about physical objects, I mean, this is why I think Descartes is, I mean, a lot of people give Descartes a, a, a hard time um, and there's, there's reasons to do that. But um, this is why I like, I like Descartes because um, what he does is he gets us in this like really um, almost, you know, as he will put it indubitable way, uh, he gets us to the conscious experience, but the worry is always with Descartes is that you can't then get to the physical world because if you have conscious experiences, then those things um, are just as likely. They it predict everything. It could just be that the evil demon does it in a very consistent and, you know, kind of a, uh, um, repeatable and uh, nomologically uh, consistent way where uh, you can't rule that out just by viewing the experience. And that's I, where Descartes... I don't, I don't need to. So, so I think you're confusing... Well, I thought you just said, you said, you, uh, not rule out in a, in a like uh, completely, you know, with certainty, but just, or infallible fallible way, but just you said that you're more justified in believing that the physical world exists over that the evil demon world exists. And I haven't yet heard why you just said the one is more predictable than the other, but I haven't, I, I that's Descartes, you know, kind of revenge in a way is that th it's not, I mean, it, it could be just as predictable as the physical uh, world would be. Yeah, yeah. So the argument isn't that it makes different predictions. It's not the underdetermination is a thing. There's infinitely many theories that will predict any any amount of data. So that yeah. doesn't matter. What matters is is which one in your brain does. 
And so if there's a guy next to me and his brain has the evil demon hypothesis and it makes all the same predictions mine does, he's justified in believing that he is in being deluded by an evil demon that, in my brain. Fair enough. But I'm just I'm just trying to get to how it does for your brain, if you want to put it that way. How does it in your brain privilege or sort of make, you know, how is the, the thesis that the physical world exists? more successful than the evil demon hypothesis. And, and again, I think what you said is that it better predicts the world, but, but I'm, not, I'm not hearing how, and that's, that's really where I think Descartes' uh, uh, project makes lots of trouble because there's, you can just imagine anything with the evil demon doing the exact same things that you would experience if the, just the physical world existed. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. So, like anybody can start with any random hypothesis. No, so I know. imagine a billion people and they all have I'm different. I'm talking about in your brain. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Try, try to okay, slow sorry. down. Just go, go a little slower here. So, if any person makes up a hypothesis in the brain, doesn't matter what it is. Okay. And they predict things about the future and they get it right. Whatever the hypothesis is, even if infinitely many others make the exact same predictions, that person is justified in believing the one they believed. And that's it. They need nothing more. There's no other justification. You don't need to predict more things. If you have a starting belief, whatever it is, and it makes predictions and you get them right, you are justified in believing that belief, no matter what the other beliefs also predict. So even if that guy has a different set of beliefs that makes the same predictions and he's justified in believing the alternative hypothesis, I didn't start with that. I started with mine and mine made the predictions. And since I'm aware of mine and believe mine and mine works coherently with my worldview and it corresponds to reality and my ability to explain to like experience things, I am justified in believing that. So th simply the fact that I have a hypothesis, which could be arbitrary, doesn't matter what the hypothesis is, doesn't matter if alternatives make the same predictions or not. If I start with a hypothesis and it works, I'm justified in believing that hypothesis, no matter what it is. I don't need to exclude others. I don't need to make different predictions than others. The other guy can make it exactly the same predictions with a different hypothesis and he can be justified in that position totally fine. The only thing I need is I have a hypothesis and a belief makes predictions and they're correct. And whatever that belief is, it's justified for me. Okay. And so then what if you have two hypotheses that you're trying to decide between? How do you, how do you work that out? And those are, those both make equal predictions um, and are equally on, for you and your brain well justified. Uh, then they would be equally well justified. You can just pick whichever one you want. If you want, I don't have that. Yeah, and I, I guess it, what I was trying to press you for is why not? Why, why isn't the evil demon just as successful? But we can move on. We don't need to keep. It's not as coherent. It's not a world. I did not use that to make the predictions that I made but in my How, how is it not? That's what I'm. I did not use it to make the predictions. Okay, so just as a matter of fact, you're choosing the physical world's existence and naturalism over something like a evil demon or a sort of um, idealist view or something to that effect. Um, and it's because for you, as you worked it out, as a matter of fact, not as like a, all things considered, it, it just happened to make more coherent sense for you. Well, it works. So I, I met, had a hypothesis, made predictions and it worked. And okay. so, I'm just so not necessarily that. true, but, but idealism, idealism is separate because idealism um, the worldview seems to make alternative predictions that are false. Now you can ad hoc it and try and make it fit, but it seems like um, the primacy of matter over mind is very well established. And if idealism was true, you'd expect the opposite to be the case. So there's good reasons to reject idealism. Uh, brain in the vat hypothesis could make the same predictions. It just seems to be, uh, it doesn't have any utility to it. Uh, you wouldn't expect there to be any uniformity to that world it would be ad hoc, whereas mine is, you would expect uniformity and you get predictions out of it. And so I like that hypothesis better. And so I use it to make predictions and they worked. And so I'm justified in believing that. So work, but are you happy to say that it works? Not necessarily that it's true or like, it's just justified for you and your brain. That's, that's what I hear you're saying. Well, if it works, I would be justified to believe it's true. That's what justification means. Okay. Well, so, I mean, I can't prove it's true with certainty. Yeah, I don't but, need to. But works, you know, being tied to justification is, of course, not a uh, is a pretty controversial view. Well, all all of them are. All of the truth claims sure, are in philosophy. Sure. Yeah, and and I would push back to say that I don't think that uh, matter being uh, having a kind of primacy is 
the dominant view out there. I think it's, it is a major player, but it's certainly not the dominant view. I mean, when you consider all the theists and all the people who believe in God, I mean, um, that's got to figure in uh, to, to the equation. And so, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't buy it. And, and it really wouldn't matter to me if it would, and I don't think it would matter to you or it shouldn't matter to you given what you've just said, because you're, you're sort of, putting everything within your own brain and how it, how it works for you. So what other people, how it works for other people, it seemed to me that you were diminishing the value of the person next to you who comes to it. Um, and not in a bad way, but just saying like, that's, that's fine. That's for you. That's fine. If somebody next to you sees the evil demon hypothesis as working for them, that's, that's, that's fine for them. Yeah, if they have a different model and they make predictions, yeah. that's correct. But I would I would push back on the like, Phil Survey's paper. There have been a number of published polls on academics of every relevant field. And uh, physics, definitely all physical predominantly. Very few of anybody believes in uh, the spiritual side. Neurology, 99-something percent, all physical. Um, uh, philosophy, I think it's more split, but I still think the vast majority are physicalists. I think it's like in the 60s, 70s range so i think in most academic fields uh the predominant view is physicalism of some sort or other probably but um again in the in the broader world i i you know i mean again it, to, but this doesn't matter to me so much because i'm i'm descartes i'm starting with uh I, I mean i'm not descartes but i'm i'm cartesian in this sense that i'm starting with my own existence you are literally descartes <laughs> yeah right right um now we're really off starting with my own existence, I have conscious experience. And then anyway, so maybe we push on a little bit, but um, I don't think we ever necessarily, uh, I, I, I believe in the physical world, so I'm not an idealist. Um, but I think that one thing that I love about Descartes is that what we, what we come to realize we know best is our own conscious experiences. And I think as we, and again, maybe this just works for me in my own uh, brain or what I would say in my own mind um, is that that conscious experience is non-natural. That's where we were. I think that's where we were uh, uh, sort of departed from the discussion there a little bit. So to get back to that, I think as we reflect on, uh, I think it's clearly non-natural in the sense, not, not natural as in being known or being, you know, sort of testable, but natural being something like um uh the way it's often defined actually is like testable by science um and we really can't test for conscious experience itself we can test for brain activity um but i can't know exactly what's going on in your mind if you have a mind um but th there are ways in which i can know what's going on in your brain and so on and so I think what we know best is our conscious experience and those as we, again, there's, it, it's definitional in a way, like how we're going to define natural, but. Yeah. I wanted to ask about that. So yeah. you you said defined as not testable by science. That would be, Sorry. that seems to lead to some very strange contradictions. Um, Cause a lot of things in science aren't testable by science. Like, uh, antiparticles aren't testable in a lot of ways. Black holes aren't testable. Is that, supernatural like no, yeah i, I don't think anybody said, in science would say no no no, no. I, I should have said something like discoverable or something to that effect by science discover well i mean that one's i think is also as is, is strange because then like string theory many worlds hypothesis just wouldn't be would be supernatural and i don't think anybody thinks those are supernatural i think that a more contemporary definition of natural would be as ruled by something like the laws of physics so unguided natural yeah. forces That's and fine. so it's not really it's discoverable but more like guided by the natural forces of the universe as opposed to like intentionality or yeah, I like some other guided, ontology i don't like the word guided there but um but i think that's in the same neighborhood that it's again by physics so it's going to be by science that we um come to know these things something to that effect well i think the epistemology is is irrelevant there because natural is like an ontology question what is it made of and we want to say it's made of something analogous to matter and energy just like a force field something that's it uh, as opposed to like a mind or magic or um, some kind of alternative ontology other than the stuff that we currently know about through matter and energy so i think natural is usually defined as analogous to something made of 
pretty much matter and energy or some constituent of matter and energy mm -hmm. and supernatural would be as a new kind of ontology beyond the matter and energy stuff. And that's, I think that's fine. I, I think we can go with that. And when I reflect upon my conscious experience, I don't find matter and energy. Why? Because it's not there. I don't even know. I don't even know. I, I can hypothesize that matter and energy exists on the basis of my conscious experience. But when I reflect on my conscious experience, uh, you know, whatever it may be, it might be, um, you know, thinking about a uh, the tree that's outside my window, let's say, or I've stubbed my toe and I'm, you know, in pain. It's the hurtfulness of that pain that I'm that I'm aware of directly in that sense. And then I can hypothesize that there's a material physical world tree that's outside my window here. Uh, and I can hypothesize that there was a, you know, brick that I that I tripped on or something and stubbed my toe. But that's all inferences from what I know in my own conscious experience. All right. So I would agree there. I'd say that um, when we see any given object, we don't see matter or energy. Like nobody sees matter or energy in its, yeah. in its essence or form. Okay. Um, but the question is, is if we start with any given object, um, we can ask the question, is it fundamental or is it um, an emergent property that's a composite of some other more fundamental thing? And of those two, it doesn't seem like we have any reason to think that consciousness or any any new object we ever discover would be one of the fundamental things as opposed to being a composite. And if it's a composite, there's no reason to think it couldn't be a composite of matter. Um, obviously, we don't. it may be hard to understand how matter could combine in such a way to create certain properties like consciousness or quality experience. But that isn't actually an argument. It can't happen. That just means you can't imagine how it could happen. And so there could be an undiscovered law of physics that allows it to happen. And so there's no reason to think it couldn't just be physical in a new way that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, I think I would say literally the opposite. <laughs> I think I would say that we have no reason to think that matter and energy are at bottom. Um, because again, what we know best is that we have conscious experience. It, 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 I, there's no way to inspect it and say, oh, look, there's, there's matter and energy at bottom here and that it's some sort of emergent property. I think we can hypothesize that, but again, how it presents to us, I, I would you know, assume our, our conscious experiences are uh, you know, somewhat uniform across uh, humanity. Uh, it, I have no reason to think that that matter is at the bottom of it. I'm not sure I follow that reasoning. So like, I would say that obviously we start with conscious experience epistemologically. So epistemological solipsism, as you mentioned. Um, but that doesn't, there's nothing about that that would, we could infer consciousness is fundamental. It tells us nothing, whether or not it's fundamental or composite gives us no indication one way or the other. Um, and then from the, I think therefore I am, we can say there's some difference between the certain kinds of things I'm experiencing. I, I can experience a TV when I look in front of me, I can experience a unicorn when I imagine a unicorn, but there's clearly some difference between these two things. One, one seems to be experiential, one seems to be imaginary. So we need some way to classify, differentiate of our experiences, which ones are the experiential kind and which ones are the imaginary kind. Um, and from that we get the scientific method, essentially. And the scientific method, very good at this, has demonstrated that there are lots of things out there that are way beyond what we would expect. Oh, we didn't imagine these first. We discovered them, particles, neutrons, neutrinos, uh, atoms, quarks, quantum fields, blah, 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 lots of things. And there seems to be a hierarchy that we can test. Physics, chemistry, biology, brains, consciousness. And consciousness seems to only appear in brains. And when we want to mess with consciousness, we mess with brains. But we can't do the other way around. So if if we wanted to assume, let's say, that consciousness was fundamental and brains were superlative to consciousness, we should be able to do things like mess with the physical world with our brains without having to go through a physical medium like hands. No, so you like can't. if I could use the you force, can't. if I could use the force and pick well, up a TV force, remote. But... Well, well, just, just to like to go with my analogy, if I could use yeah. the force and pick up a TV remote with my mind, my mind powers, that would be really good evidence that consciousness was more fundamental than matter because consciousness could influence matter in a way that wasn't 
um, via the means of a physical okay. meat sack. In good, my good. Brain. Can I, let me just jump in. Right. So I don't think necessarily that consciousness when it comes to the human person, I think this is where we maybe are talking past each other a little bit. I'm not saying I'm not committed to the idea that consciousness is more fundamental than say matter and our bodies and so on. I, I'm, I would be a substance dualist where these are sort of conjoined in a way so that there is causal direction both ways though, but clearly we can affect the brains. I mean, this is, this is like, uh, like the, for a child to go through trauma, to, to experience fear over and over and over again, which would be conscious experience of fear can, ch has major impact on the brain in various ways. Yeah. But if consciousness and, was fundamental to reality, we would be able to do interact with things more than just the brain. If we can only interact with the brain, like if I say like uh, an electrical socket was plugged into an electrical outlet, if I can jiggle the outlet and I can move the socket, well, obviously it's like, there's a one way connection, but if we want to see one's form, one's more fundamental than the other, then it should be able to mess with the other stuff in the house, not just yeah, the electrical. But that's what I'm saying. I'm not committed to the idea that one is more fundamental to the other in terms of the human person. That's why I think we're having, we kind of slid into a discussion of philosophy of mind here. I, I'm making the claim that the divine mind serves as the proper sort of metaphysical grounding of all reality. So that's one claim. And then as we started, you know, kind of went into Descartes a little and we started, I think, therefore I am. Um, and, and I was just making the point that um, our conscious experience is what we know best. And what the point that I'm, I'm building to haven't got quite got there yet, which is totally fine, uh, is that I think without God on that picture, then I don't know that I'm, I'm kind of Descartes this way, too, is that uh, if I, if we don't have God, then we can't rule out the evil demon. Right. We don't have more justification. But so that's that's a whole other thing. But right now we're talking about kind of in the middle of that, we're talking about the philosophy of mind of how to understand the human person. And I, I would say, kind of just focusing on what we know best, which is, again, I think part of the, the upshot of Descartes' meditations and other, other parts of Descartes, is that we know we're thinking things, like we know conscious experience best. And I don't, again, I don't think that that's, funda you know, in a way like more fundamental to the human person. I think they're, they're both there. And I think there's a two-way causality that's clearly the case, that we can... We can, you know, even if you just all of a sudden somebody, you know, came at you in an aggressive way, you know, <laughs> sitting there in your, your overstuffed chair or whatever, like you would probably start to have physical manifestations of that fear that you're experiencing. Your heart rate, heart rate would rise, your eyes would widen, you know, you might start to perspire, you know, th those kind of things. Like those are physical manifestations of conscious experience itself. So I'm just saying... There's clearly a, two, it's not, it's not the way I think you were describing it as only we can mess with the physical and that has, you know, conscious experience results. We can mess with the conscious experience and have physical results too. Well, so I was agreeing with that, but what we want, we, I don't really care. The person doesn't matter. What I care about is which okay. is more fundamental to reality. Okay. So we want to figure out which is like, is there a hierarchy? Are they, are consciousness and matter at the same level fundamentally in reality or is one higher than the other in reality? And to do that, we do it in the same way we'd like stacking cards. If we knock down the bottom cards, all of them fall. If we knock down the top cards, the rest on the bottom are fine. They're not really affected. And so we can do a hierarchy assessment of, can we mess with consciousness by messing with the brain? Yes. Can we mess with the other stuff? like in reality by messing with the physical matter stuff. Yes, I can blow stuff up with TNT just fine. Don't need any consciousness for that. Can I use consciousness to affect anything outside of the brain without a physical medium? No. So Wait, now it seems mean? like- Explain that a force. little more. Like use the, can I use the force? Can I use my mind powers to do stuff in reality without why, using- Why is not me raising my arm, me using conscious experience to have a physical result? That's, that's what I was trying to get with the, the plug analogy. If the order of operations starts with the consciousness goes to the brain and I can't go from consciousness to TV, that means that the hierarchy starts with 
the matter, not the other way around. So the, the top layer of the cards is the consciousness. Then it has to go to the brain, which is the next one. Then it has to go to the hand. Then it has to go to the, the TV remote. Now, if I could just go consciousness TV remote, that's really good evidence that the consciousness is, is one of the lower levels of the cards. I don't need all this, this like strange, weird stuff from the brain to the hand to that. That's all very arbitrarily weird and small. But I can do that with the matter. I, I can skip all the, the, the other steps and just go, um, TNT blow up TV. I don't need to go the whole, all this random s- steps between my bot- biological functions. And so it seems very good evidence that the order of operations is matter first. Consciousness is a result of matter. So it's like physics, chemistry, biology, brains, consciousness, and not the other way around. Um, but if, again, if we could yeah. manipulate things with the force, consciousness, force power, that would be great evidence of consciousness being more than just a result of brains. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't think this is, I don't think human consciousness is more fundamental. So I, I think we're just sort of off on a, on a, on a place that, um, in other words, Do I'm not have, committed to well, the, so I the wanted to go back to what you that consciousness as a general category is more fundamental than, um, in other words, all consciousness is more fundamental than matter i mean maybe in some sense i'd be committed to that but I, i'm just saying that god who is the divine mind uh for the purpose of this discussion is serves as the metaphysical ground of reality as we find it now where do we find it i think we find it with reflecting on our conscious experiences and we find a whole lot of features there that i think are best explained by a divine mind well, so I was starting with the cogito, just my consciousness. I don't have access to God's right. consciousness. Right. So with just my consciousness, we can do this card thing and see that yeah, consciousness seems to be way less fundamental than brains. I, and so, I don't agree with that. I'm I'm saying my own consciousness doesn't seem any more fundamental. I, I'm not making that claim. I, and I don't think that figures into the argument at all. Well, well so my question would be is, why do you think there is this other consciousness that is more fundamental in yeah. any way than ours? Because to me, it seems like right. our consciousness uh, epistemologically is the first thing we have access to, and it right. doesn't seem to be very fundamental. Right. Uh, I think that's what I'm very saying contingent. Too. So I agree <laughs> with that part. So that part we yeah. say, we don't really have much reason to believe consciousness is fundamental because of our consciousness, because our yeah. consciousness is not very fundamental. Right. So where are you getting this justification to believe that there's this more fundamental consciousness? Yeah. Okay, good. And that's where I was try, trying to get to, I think. Uh, what I want to say is that we, so we have our conscious experience. We, I, again, I'm claiming that epistemologically we know that best. And what we see is it's this very, um, uh, I was going to say very contingent, but that just sounds so sort of uh, a silly way to put it. But, um, it's it's a it, it is a contingent thing that's in flux and changing and emotion and seems to come and seems to go and sure. and so the reality that and and now i think that you know unlike the idealist i think we can infer that there is the sort of physical world that when i am seeing a tree um, you know, having the conscious experience of a tree there really is a physical tree that gives rise to my conscious experience Again, I'm making the point that I know the conscious experience better than the physical, better than the material. I, I don't think we ever have direct access to the, the, the tree as material. I think we always have it as tree as phenomenal. Um, but I do think we can make, it, make a sort of inference to the best explanation that the, tr- the physical tree is there. But then as we understand what that thing would be, we realize it's a contingent, finite, thing and then as we look around at the world that's all we have experience of and so to follow the inference through there needs to be something that grounds uh those those experiences and and the things that we find too and we can we can expand this out though we don't need to get off track so so I i would agree with everything you said there um consciousness is contingent we can see things around us it seems like matter is there that also seems contingent and so Um, there must be some more fundamental thing than what we're directly experiencing to ground all that. So I'd agree with those points. And ground that in the sense that 
you know, the word causation can figure in here. I like the word ground because it's broader than that. It's not just merely causing or creating, if you like. I mean, you probably don't like that, but uh, right. It is, you know, bringing into existence and also sustaining into existence. It, so it's like a, a, a fuller, richer term to say that it, it grounds reality. Um, we, that, that's what we need. And that's where I'm saying we, we don't have a lot of options. And, and so if I, I think, because you were pushing back on this before, but it sounded like you were just saying it does need to, ha to have a ground. But I'm saying because of its contingency, because of all these features that we find in it uh, or true of it, that it can't be its own ground. And this is just my, my move is to say, OK, so we need something else and we need something that's non-contingent, that's non, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, finitely temporal, that's that's non um, that's not in flux, that's not in motion and so on. And I think you you don't have a lot of options here at this point. And, and, and again, I would just say just to sort of, uh, you know, unless you're going to propose other options, I think God best fits this, you know, bill here. He, he serves as a proper and satisfying ground of being. Right. So I'd say that there's probably infinitely many options. There's, there's lots of options to pick from. Um, and I would say that to limit the number of options, we have to go based off of the evidence we see. And the evidence we see seems to indicate that there are things that could qualify as outside of space-time, like quantum fields. And the consensus among physicists is that space and time are emergent from quantum fields. So quantum fields are a entity that is composed of only discovered properties which can qualify as something that can exist outside of space-time and create the universe and space-time and all those things. I don't see any evidence that minds can do those. All the evidence of minds is they're temporal. We have zero evidence of minds existing non-temporally, non-spatially. We have zero evidence of minds that can do anything outside of space and time. It doesn't even seem it doesn't even seem like it's nominologically possible for minds to do anything outside of space-time. Quantum fields can, though. They're very good at that. Um, and so given the options we have, it seems quantum fields are a far better option to explain um, the necessary grounds than a mind. Minds are always in flux. A non-fluxing mind would be a nothing, essentially, as far as we can tell. And so it seems like given the possibilities we have, um, quantum field is a far better option to possibly explain the necessary grounds of reality. Well, it all depends. It depends on what it is we find in our experience. So as we, uh, you know, take a few steps back and say that I think therefore I am, we have conscious experience, what, that's what we know best. What do we find there? Again, I think we find these, these features that I've already mentioned, but I also think we find uh, value um, and, and a variety of values. I think we find moral value. I think we find uh, aesthetic value and those sorts of things. And I'm not sure your quantum field will be able to explain those, but I'd be curious to know if you think that they do or, oh, yeah, or so maybe deny the existence of those. I don't know. I'm a moral realist. I'm a, I believe in objective morality and okay. purpose and those kinds of things too. I don't understand why a quantum field would be any less plausible to explain those things. Um, cause to me again, that's still for any given object, the options are either it's fundamental or it's a composite. And if it's a composite, then it being grounded in a mind doesn't in any way explain it. It's just saying it's there and it's a part of the mind. Well, that doesn't tell us if it's fundamental or if it's a composite either way. And to say it's there and it's a part of a quantum field applies no greater or lesser explanatory power there. So to me, it seems like the argument is a, is a like comes from like argument. Um, we see morality instantiated through agents. Um, we don't see morality instantiated through inanimate objects. Therefore, morality must be grounded in, in a um, agent. And that is uh, a hasty generalization fallacy. Um, it's like uh, hunger. Hunger we, is only instantiated through agents. Hunger is not instantiated through inanimate objects. Therefore, hunger must be grounded in a supremely hungry guy in the sky. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like I imagine there's many right. different psychological states that you fully grant are completely explained by neurological phenomena, delusions, hallucinations, optical illusions, 
there's plenty of different psychological phenomena that only are experienced by conscious agents, but are fully explained by misfirings of neurons. And so there's no reason to infer that simply because something is only expressed via agents that it must be grounded in an agent. It doesn't tell us anything one way or the other. So why would you infer that because we have values that they must be grounded in a value being as opposed to a quantum field? Yep. So you're a moral realist. So you think that moral values do exist and they're mind independent. Yes. So I, I'm not, so it's disanalogous to hunger in exactly that respect is that hunger is, it, that wouldn't be a good inference the way you put it, but, but if moral, if there are moral facts that, that truly exist uh, and genuinely exist, then we need to explain the existence of those things. We need to find something that, that I, I think the way I'd put it is it just doesn't, I don't see any reason why we would think that the quantum field explains something like moral values, the, these mind independent, um, uh, you know, things, whatever they, I, I guess, well, let me ask you this. What, what is a moral fact then? Like if it's a mind independent thing, like where is it? What is it? Law of physics. Um, what was wrong with the hunger analogy? Because that would be something that is in us. Yeah. that we can give an, an example, we can give a sort of physical description of what's going on us that causes hunger and it doesn't oh, have oh, I think to I got be you. a hungry thing. I think I got you. So it's like uh, the hunger phenomenon is a subjective neurological phenomenon and we're talking about like an objective feature of reality. So it's yeah, like, like if you look at the stars, um, you see a bunch of little dots of light in the sky. Now that's not a neurological subjective phenomenon in your brain. That's photons that have been created through the laws of physics and gravity and electromagnetism um, millions of light years away that were then sent to your eyes. And then the weakened electromagnetic force in how the dendrites in your eyes form send the signals to your brain. So even though you're having a sensation that is subjective, like hunger, um, this sensation isn't grounded in your brain. It's grounded in reality. There's a thing in reality, namely the laws of physics that generate these things and generate the interactions with your brain. And this is an objective feature. It's not subjective. And so morality. What's the objective be feature? The laws of physics. But the experience is subjective. Yeah. The experience doesn't matter though. And, and it could, it could have gone in infinitely different ways. Like you could have had the taste of, strawberry shortcake in your mouth when looking up at the night sky. Like those, those are not like nomological connections, like necessary connections. Yeah, but they don't need to be. That's not, that's not right. Right. But I'm just saying the experience that we have is different from the whole thing that you just described. Right. Uh, I, I mean, it's not an, are well, you so, so the, the point, the point you of the analogy, that that's all that it is, is a, is the photons and the, and the dendrites and everything you just said. No, no, no. So, so let me continue with my analogy for, okay. for a bit. So like the laws of physics are objective. It, it, this experience of seeing the starry skies is not grounded in your subjective mental states. It's grounded in reality. There's something objectively independent that causes these states. Your sense experience could be wrong, but that, that doesn't matter. The point is, is that these are grounded in an objective feature of reality and morality could be the same. It could be a law of physics and that law of physics could be like gravity and it permeates the universe and interacts with us such that we feel moral intuitions. Um, and those could be wrong. There are definitely people who are psychopaths who don't have moral intuitions or have wrong ones and that's fine. The point is that it could be grounded not in a psychological state like hunger, but it could be grounded in a law of physics like gravity, which permeates the universe and affects our brains to have the sensations of morality. Mm -hmm. But it's not, I, I wouldn't say that it's grounded in those things. It's caused by those things. Like I you're don't... not describing what, um, what the conscious, at least I wouldn't think you're describing what the conscious experience is. You're just giving a correlation to what gives rise to that. Well, I don't think the conscious experience is morality. I think the conscious experience is an experience of morality, just like we have an experience of uh, something. No, that no, no. See. I meant the conscious experience of looking at the night sky. Wasn't that what you were describing in that analogy? Well, no, no. In that analogy, the point is the night sky, the, the actual stars, the actual right. photons. But that Those doesn't are... ground 
our conscious experience that right, right. causes I don't, I don't, it, so, that so gives the rise to it. Doesn't matter here. So the point is, is that the grounding of the stars is reality. So if morality is a thing that's objective, the grounding of morality can also be reality, whether or not we experience it. We don't need to experience it. And we can experience it and it could be faulty, whether or whether we experience it at all doesn't matter, but it can be grounded completely independent of experience as a law of physics, just like gravity is there, independent of experience. And then we experience it through a medium of intuitions or sensations. I mean, so whether or not we experience it just doesn't matter at all. What matters is, is what can ground morality can be a completely non-conscious thing that can then affect conscious things. Just like hunger can be a completely grounded in a completely non-conscious thing that affects conscious things. Okay. Uh, do you think that, so you're saying that morality is just is like the, the moral fact just is a physical fact. Yes, that's moral naturalism. That is the position. And where and, and are these facts normative facts? Mm, I don't like like normative has multiple different definitions and whether or not oughtness is actually a property is I think you don't need oughtness, but you can still have normative qualities to it. It's a more complicated position. Yeah, what do you mean? Because that sounds like you're denying normativity. Mm, you deny, in, other, in other words, if you deny oughtness, you're de denying normativity. Uh, no, that's very not, basic sense not, of normativity. Not technically true. So if you go to moral naturalism, there's different interpretations of morality and whether or not you need oughts. I think you don't need oughts because I think oughts are human gibberish. Um, so like, is something moral because you ought to do it or ought you do it because it's moral? How would you answer that? Say the question again. I'm sorry. Is something moral because you ought to do it or ought you do it because it's moral? Uh, you ought to do it because it's moral. Bingo. And that's essentially the euthyphro dilemma. But what it states is that if oughtness or normativity was intrinsic to morality, then you then it's moral because you ought to do it, which it's not the case. Well, you ought to do something because it's moral. And so if I was like going to draw a Venn diagram for you, what this would mean is um, ought you do something because it's moral means that the qualities of morality, if you like draw a bubble around morality and all the different properties of whatever makes it up, oughtness isn't in that bubble. Oughtness is outside of that bubble and you ought to do something because morality is instantiated and you, and you define more oughtness as having to do with whatever morality is defined as. Now, if something, uh, if you ought to do some, or if it's moral because you ought to do it, that means that there's the bubble of morality and oughtness is inside of that bubble. It's moral because you ought to do it. So oughtness is inside of morality. It is a intrinsic property required of morality. Um, and so the, the point of the contrast is the first horn is um, it's moral because you ought to do it would show that oughtness is intrinsic of morality and you ought to do it because it's moral shows oughtness is extrinsic to morality. It's not required in morality at all. And so I think that given most of our intuitions, oughtness isn't required in morality at all. It's kind of irrelevant. It's a human no, addition. no, 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 you can't get there from, from that. I, that that's the leap I think is to go from is to push it. I, and I don't get, I'm not sure what you mean by the bubble here, but, um, I think I know what you mean by intrinsic or extrinsic because the move was to make it extrinsic and then it's therefore uh, not needed or gibberish or however you put it. But I don't think that follows for sure. I mean, I don't know why anybody would concede that uh, to say that something um, we ought to do something because it's moral doesn't put it, make it extrinsic or unnecessary. Are all. you familiar with the Euthyphro dilemma? Yeah. So in the youth for the limits, is something pious because the gods say it or do the gods say it because it's pious? The point right. being that um, if the gods say it because it's pious, that means it's pious based off some independent standard and the gods are just arbitrarily saying it. But if it's pious because the gods say it, then the, the determining factor is the gods say so and they make it pious because they said so. And so the point of the dilemma is to establish the primacy of one of the premises. Is it the piety or is it the gods say so? Um, and so the same thing applies to the analogy I'm using is the primacy, which is more important, um, the core of the morality or the oughtness. And pretty much everybody I've asked gives the same answer you do. It's not 
you ought to do something because it's moral. That is the correct answer. I agree. Morality is more important than oughtness. Um, and so I think that oughtness is really irrelevant. It's just something See, to that, add on. But that's the point. I don't mean to cut you off again here, but that's, that's, the, that's the point where you say, therefore, it's just irrelevant. Just because you say you ought to do something because it's moral doesn't therefore make oughtness irrelevant. Uh, right? Because there could be entailment here. It could be the case that because there is a moral fact that entails that you ought to do X. And so well, that would be the first one. So, so it, it's kind yeah. of like in the youth of you couldn't say the no, same thing. No, it's downstream say... from morality. So ontologically, it's the moral fact is the case. And that entails, so downstream, what's more primary to use your word is the moral fact, but that entails that you ought to do. So so X is morally right. That entails that you ought to do X. Now there's entailment. You can't just say, therefore it's irrelevant. Therefore we just lop off oughtness. Um, I mean, you can, but that just doesn't follow with what I've conceded and what you, if you've put this to others, they've conceded because it could be an, an entailment relation there. And these go hand in hand so that wherever you have a moral fact, you have oughtness. And, and, in, and in fact, I would say that's the standard view of morality is that you don't have you're not talking about morality unless it entails how we ought to live, unless it entails uh, normativity. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing about the Euthyphro dilemma, wherever you have the God say it's so, not it the must be dilemma. bias. Well, no, 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 yeah. the, the point of the entailments between the two premises would be the same so if you say there is an entailment between the god saying so and it making something pious like okay that's just granting the right but horn. then that's or if, arbitrary. Or if you say the, or if you well the arbitrariness is is not the point i'm trying to get for it's the entailment right criteria. but that's that's the consequence of that horn that people right. find troubling it's not the it's not that then you'd have to do what the gods say um it's that you'd have to do what the gods say and that thing would be arbitrary Right, but that's that part is irrelevant to to what's important to me or what the part I'm. I'm <laughs> I get that. I get that. Um, yeah. So, so the point here is that either way, you can say that there is an entailment of piety relationship to what the gods say or what right. gods say to the piety relationship, and the one that's more important, I think, is the one, the only one you need to keep. You don't need to keep the other one. Is is irrelevant? It's not more important. It's, it's superfluous. It's literally just a it's consequence not, of the other. Yeah, one. No, so it's like I don't a relabeling. Anybody, I, I can't imagine anybody. Well, well, so, so let me let me work, is, let me work you through this. So if, like if the gods, realist, I, I don't. I can't imagine a moral realist saying, um, "Moral facts." Now, now, what you might have, so like, there are people that say, make a distinction between moral values and moral obligations, because we're not always obligated to do you know, certain things uh, that are morally right to do. So I'm not obligated to go serve at my, you know, local homeless shelter, let's say. Um, but it would be morally good or morally praiseworthy or even morally right if I did, right? So there, there's a distinction there, but to, to lop off and say it's superfluous to have moral um, normativity or any oughtness whatsoever I just, I, I don't think we're talking about morality anymore at that point. Well, so as I mentioned earlier in Moral Naturalism on the page for Stanford Encyclopedia, there are examples that literally say oughtness is irrelevant, but um, that would be a, a debate you could have with the other academics on the topic. But the important thing is here, the consequence of the youth of a dilemma, piety is irrelevant now, because if it's just what the gods say, you don't need the word piety. It just tells you nothing other than what the gods say. So this word piety loses all value because it's not describing anything more than just what the gods say. So if oughtness is the same and it's an entailment of morality, the oughtness loses all independent value. It's nothing now. It's just describing the morality. Um, and so that would be why it's unnecessary. And it seems like oughtness as a concept is pretty irrelevant um, and unnecessary what? for morality at all. Well, why is that? Why would you need it? So if there's a moral fact, like it is immoral to, to drown a baby or something, yeah. whether or not you ought to do it, is irrelevant what tell me more explain that because I, I i it feels like you're saying well, well so like morally, if i said it, it's a moral fact that i should not do this terrible and horrendous thing to this baby but whether or not you ought to do it i'm i'm kind of either way <laughs> no so like if morality is that which corresponds to god's nature or something 
Um, just to pick an example, or it could be a platonic okay. object, abstract object, law sure. of physics. It doesn't make a difference. Sure. Whatever corresponds to this object. Sure. If something doesn't correspond to that object, it is immoral. Now, whether or not you want to do it or ought to do it makes no difference. Because Why, whether though? or not, wait, wait, wait. So whether or not you have some oughtness makes no factual correspondence difference to whether or not this fact corresponds to the nature of God. If it corresponds to the nature of God, that makes it moral. Right. Now you add on this, whether or not you ought to do it, but whether or not you ought to do it makes no difference to whether or not it corresponds to God. Right. If that's it corres- true. Right. That's so true. if it corresponds to God, it's moral. And this okay. oughtness thing, like it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's gone. It makes no difference. You don't no. Even need to consider it. No, no. The only thing that matters to morality is does it correspond to the no, no, nature no. of that, morality? But you just, there's the slippage there. Like you, you just changed it. You went from it doesn't matter for its corresponding to the nature of God yeah. to it doesn't matter at all. So like truth is like a moral fact is true if it yeah. corresponds to the nature of God, right? Yeah. And now we want to have a moral discussion and figure out how we ought to live. But that's irrelevant to the truth to of morality. Like it's irrelevant. To... It may be in a strict sort of strict sense, irrelevant to the truth or the correspondence yeah, it's being a moral fact. Yes. But now we want to have this whole dimension we call morality and figure out how we ought to live. And yeah, if you're that's... saying that's irrelevant, it sounds like you're saying it's irrelevant whether or not you kill the baby or drown the baby or not. And I, I, no. I, I, I'm guessing you're not meaning that, but that's that's what it seems to me to be saying. If you say oughtness doesn't matter, though, it's just. Because it's what's stopping me from just saying, yeah, that's a moral fact, but I don't care about it. I'm, I'm not going to live my life by it. It's not like it makes it such that I ought to live that way. That sounds like what you're saying. But I, I and again, I'm not saying that you would do that, obviously. I'm just saying because you I think you know that you ought not to do that. Well, it sounds like you just admitted that the oughtness has nothing to do with the truth of morality. Morality can be true with, completely with the, independent of the oughtness. Oughtness it makes no right. difference to the truth whatsoever. The truth of morality. Or the correspondence. The truth, yes. That, that's, the, that's all I'm talking okay. about. So, so the but truth listen, it's not morality has nothing to do with oughtness. Oughtness is gone from the truth statements of morality. It's not even in there. It's completely okay. irrelevant. I, again, I'm not con- probably conceding all that, but just for the sake of the argument, I can say that whether or not something corresponds to the nature of God, I'm not having the discussion about oughtness at this point. But now that I realize, okay, this moral fact is a fact, now oughtness comes in full force. Because now, because reality is not just about truth, right? On a, on a full-fledged view, philosophical view, it would be truth, beauty and goodness and we need to figure out how we ought to live like in other words it does me no good to teach my son let's say uh here's what the moral fact is i i need to now move on from that to say now i want to teach you how to you ought to live and that's where oughtness figures in deeply like to say that it's gibberish like so if somebody what would you say to somebody, again, not, not you or not, right, I'm not trying to do a cheap shot here at all. Uh, if somebody is considering, <laughs> is that a back scratcher? Yeah, a back scratcher. Nice, man. I, the overstuffed chair and a back scratcher. I don't yep. know why you n- ever need to get up. Honestly. I don't. I'm, I'm like glued to the chair. It's, it's just <laughs> absorbed into me. So what would you say to somebody who's considering to do, doing something horrendous, like just awful, and, and you say, hey, look, man, like this is the moral fact. You should, or you, this is the moral fact, right? I almost said you shouldn't do it, but that's oughtness. What would you say to them if they say, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I'm going to do it. I don't care well, about that that's moral the, fact. Well, that's the part that I think is gibberish. Like, what difference does that make? Like, whether or not I'm able to convince them or whether or not a fact would convince them makes no, 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 no I'm difference. I'm not talking about convincing them. I'm just saying, what would you say? Would you just what, say... What Okay, yeah, there's no such thing as oughtness. That's gibberish. Well, I'd you, say they're, they're, they're factually going to do an immoral action. Like, Unless like, you were to tell them you ought not to do that. Well, that's going to make zero difference one way or the other. Like, How do we, we know? know? 
What if they we, say, we have, oh, I realize that, I, you know, I, I consider it to be on your view, these come apart. Like on my view, they don't because it entails like if something is a moral fact that it entails, you ought not to do it. Well, we know right? psychologically so these, that's false. We know psychologically view, there's we, no connection between. Okay, let me, but, but, oh, let me finish. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know I've cut you off, too. So. Uh, uh, that's what I did. <laughs> uh, OK, so on your view, these come apart. You have moral facts and oughtness is irrelevant as gibberish, right? But on my view, I would say, here, here's the step is to say, look, this is a true moral fact. And now that we've established with some person that's considering doing, so, it doesn't even have to be horrendous, just something like lying on a, you know, cheating on an exam, let's say, um, which is bad, but not, you know, there's worse. Uh, and they, and I convinced them to say that's wrong. And then I, the conclusion of which for me would be to say, so therefore you ought not to do that. But you're saying that's just gibberish. What happens when somebody says, so, so for me, if somebody says, I don't care that that's a moral fact, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to say, well, look, if you, if you concede it's a moral fact, then you know, you realize that you ought not to do it. And maybe they would change their mind if they see that connection. I don't know. I'm just right. But for you, you're you're literally conceding that there's no oughtness that attaches to something's being a moral fact. It would seem to me you would just have to say to be consistent with your view, like, hey, you be you. If you want to concede that it's a moral fact, then you can do whatever you want because there's no oughtness that attaches to moral facts. Well, so this is why I think that makes gibberish. sense. Uh, no, but so like the, really? what comes to mind is that... Um, if I'm trying to, I want a model of objective morality. What is the minimum criteria I need for a model of objective morality? Oughts are not a part of that. I can say a moral, to have objective morality, I need an instantiation, God's nature, platonic objects, a priori abstract, some, something to instantiate the moral yeah, facts and correspondence, fact, wait, 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 and okay, correspondence to that. That's what the moral fact is, the correspondence to the instantiator of the moral fact. Okay. Now I have that, I have objective morality. I need to make no no statements about oughts whatsoever. I have objective morality. Oughts are not required to this. And I then... I don't see why. I just don't see why. Why, remember why are we were oughtness about, not part of that? If it corresponds to God's nature, that's what makes it moral, right? You don't need... You don't, no, no mission that of oughts. That makes the anymore. moral fact, but it doesn't tell us... It doesn't tell us how to live is. morally. I don't I don't need any of that. Why? The only that's part, the only part I'm asking is the moral fact. Do I have the moral fact if it corresponds to God's nature? That's all, I'm, that's all I need. No, I think if you have, if you say, and by the way, this moral fact has nothing to do with oughtness, then I don't think you really genuinely have a moral fact because I think by their very nature, they entail oughtness and normativity. Well, that, that's the same that seems obviously false because like even earlier you admitted that, yeah, if it corresponds to God's nature, you have a moral fact. You don't- You have a moral fact. Like, and, and now you it. have that's a moral you that entails oughtness. Well, again, you, that's the you part need that's like saying in the world. If you're well, that, to have that seems morality. to be like an arbitrary assertion you've made based off of nothing. So it's like no. if I said I have a moral fact and it entails a potato. Like, what? Why? What? Why? Why do you need that? And then you, this is where you give the argument. No, for... you couldn't possibly think that. You don't think that, do you? Do you think that's literally the logically equivalent scenario? Yes. Yes. That because when I, when I tell my you know student who's who's uh, I catch him, you know, writing his answers on at the bottom of his shoe or something uh, about to go into the exam. And I say, it, it's wrong. I think already that's a normative term. But um, if I say it's a moral fact that you that you <laughs> see, I almost can't even say it without using the word ought or should or right or wrong. It's These are all normative that. facts. So Just... if I say, look, it corresponds to reality that um, that is immoral. That that is immoral. But I, again, I feel like that's even a normative term. But um, so and he, and he says, I agree. And I say, so therefore, you ought not to do it. But that on your view, error. you would have to say, but that's irrelevant to what you do here in this test. It's just just letting you know that that's a moral fact that 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 cheating on the exam does not correspond to the nature of God or to nature you know, morality, some physical yeah. law or something like that. Yeah, then, yeah, but it, you it say, seems... but you be you, you do what you want. That has no oughtness, no normativity. That doesn't have, that doesn't impinge on what you do at all. 
Well, it doesn't. We know it doesn't. We know that um, okay, so psychological. That's fine. Wait, 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 wait. So, so we know psychological tests say that people know something is moral. It does not in any way affect their motivation to do or not. No, do. no, no I'm not talking about motivation. <laughs> One sec. So there is nothing that that oughtness does psychologically one way or the other. But That's more importantly, false. if we take the like the factual true statement, if someone goes to a test and writes one plus one equals three, and I say, that's objectively wrong. I'm not going to follow. And they say, well, I don't care. I'm not going to follow up. Oh, but you ought to. I don't care. What's right. irrelevant? What, oughtness is irrelevant. Like they're wrong. They do not correspond to reality. Full stop. That's all you need. Adding this, well, you no. ought to do one plus one equals two is just silly potato speech. It's gibberish. What? And the same thing applies to morality. Okay. If someone writes, if someone does an immoral action, I can say you have objectively done an immoral action. Full stop. I don't need to say you ought to have done otherwise. That's irrelevant. It's gibberish. I can say you have done an immoral action or you have done a moral action. Whether you ought or ought not makes no difference whatsoever. The morality is in the action and the consequence itself. And the oughts are just gibberish like do saying you, like who cares okay. do you think do you think someone ought no. to not drown babies for fun no i think it would be immoral to drown babies for fun what does that mean it means that it doesn't correspond to the nature of morality so you would be happy to say that if somebody said should i because should and ought is the same kind of normative term yep should I drown a baby? You would say, look. I'd say it's a hypothetical that's imperative. That's gibberish. That question is gibberish. And it's it's a moral fact that that you, again, you can't even say it. It's a moral so, fact. So I would, I would, I'll just answer. I would say it is immoral to drown babies for fun. If you do it, you will be immoral. I know, it but should I? does correspond to the, should is a hypothetical imperative. There is no should in the universe. It's not a so, hypothetical imperative. In, again, you're asking from my view here. So my view, it's a hypothetical imperative. There is no categorical oughts or categorical shoulds. They're irrelevant. I can tell you for a fact, this is immoral. And if you want to be immoral, then you should drown babies. If you want to be moral, you should not drown babies. But the shoulds there really? make no different to the truth statement. It is immoral to drown babies. Yeah, so that's if I ask, troubling to me. Well, it's basic philosophy. It's not like No, hard. no, no, no. It's, that's not. Uh, most... I, most people, why, why, you know, by by uh, uh, by wide margin, think that normativity and morality are necessarily connected. Even if you concede that the because goes from moral fact to normativity, um, because one is moral ontology, we're, we're deciding what is moral a moral fact. And the yeah. other is ethics, is, is your ethical theorizing, let's say, is where we figure out how we ought to live. And you're, by lopping them off, all you have is moral ontology and you have no ethical theory. Yeah, because none of the ethical theory can affect the truth values. It's literally, literally irrelevant. Literally nothing you ever do in the application side, the epistemology methodology side will ever have any effect on the truth value or the ontology so if you're talking about objective morality all of that application stuff is completely irrelevant it's confusing epistemology and ontology like no not irrelevant that's too strong it, it's not irrelevant it, it like i think i feel like what you're this this move that you've made a few times now is to say this piece is downstream from this piece. Therefore, this is completely irrelevant and gibberish and so on. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is not irrelevant. I mean, good gracious. But you're right about this, that the theory doesn't um, change the truth value of the statement of moral ontology. Full stop. Like yes. that's got to be all packed in together. It doesn't yeah. change the, the truth value of the statement of moral ontology. What it does change is the, the truth value of the statement of theory, of, of especially applied ethics. So now I'm going to say, should I do X? That Your view absolutely changed the truth value of that statement, which is a very different statement from whether or not something is a moral fact. Wait, epistemology doesn't have epistemology. I'm not talking about it. epistemology at all. No, no, no. Nothing so I the said there was epistemology of the like applied parts. I'm, I'm using like the applied part 
uh, epistemology methodologies refer to the applied? Part? No, not applied. That that's not that would not be because you might not know whether or not I do this or that, and you ought to do one or the other. You know what I mean? Like you might not know if I do X or Y, but it's definitely the case that you ought to do X. You just don't know. I mean that that's a that's just a it's not epistemology. I'm not talking about epistemology. I'm saying the truth value or, uh, of the statement of let's just say applied ethics um you know the subject s should perform the action a you're saying should or ought these terms are irrelevant that that has no for you that has no truth value well, you're what, saying as long as we get the moral ontology the sort of meta ethics figured out and, and then because the applied ethics doesn't change the truth value of that, therefore they're irrelevant. And I'm saying that just seems deeply troubling because I think there is a truth value of whether or not you should or whether or not you ought to do, uh, you know, drown babies or, or tell the truth or, you know, cheat on exams and things like that. There's a truth well, value to that, that normative statement. And you, I think you're committed to saying that there's not a truth value of that normative statement. Yeah. And you're saying truth, it's irrelevant, but it's not irrelevant because I need to know what I'm going to do on the exam today. Sorry, go ahead. Well, the truth is that which corresponds to reality and you ought to corresponds to nothing. There are no correspondences to ought statements or should statements. It disagree. can't correspond to and anything. And most, of, what most is it? What is it? ethicists disagree. Uh, yeah, Even naturalists will try to find something that grounds the oughtness. They might say it's basic or they might say it, it corresponds to like some sort of a basic experience of human experience and so on, but they definitely have normativity. Right. That's why I think the models that don't are better models. Like there's, what, what does it correspond to? Right. But then you just have to bite, bite the bullet then I think, and just well, no, I think admit I... that you don't, you would, you can't say to the person who's about to do something horrendous, that you should not do it, that you ought not to do it because you don't have applied ethics on your view. Right. No, I'm, I grant that because that's not biting a bullet. It's, it's actually a better logical position. Like what does you should not do that <laughs> correspond to? If that's no way, a true dude. statement, if that's a true statement that you should not do something, what does it correspond to? It, it is an entailment of what does it correspond to? I don't care about the entailment. What does it correspond to? Truth is that which corresponds to reality. I would say so it corresponds true, to the nature of God as well. How does you ought to do something correspond to the nature of anything? Um, I think it, I don't see any problem with saying that it is an entailment of the, the moral fact itself, that it is like when you made the intrinsic extrinsic move, I would deny that and say that part of what it is to be a moral fact is that it has normative consequences of how we ought to live. And that moral fact itself corresponds, on my view as a, as a theist, that corresponds to the nature of God in some deep sense. Well, I, I'm sure I'm sure that's what sounds like it makes sense to you. But to me, that sounds like gibberish. If I ask you, like, what does it correspond to? You can't say, you might well, think it's, it's wrong, but it's not gibberish. Else. You might think so it's so wrong, like, but it's not no, gibberish. I don't, think it's, like I don't this, think it's wrong. This is coherent. No, no, I this think it's is incoherent. a coherent statement. No, think, How is so it incoherent? Go, if you then? say the statement you should do X corresponds to an entailment of the fact that it corresponds to no, God, that I didn't does not say make that. sense. I didn't say that. I thought, I thought so, so just to go through it again. So you said the statement you should not do X cor is an entailment of a correspondence fact to the nature of God. I didn't say it just like that, but let's go with that. So what's what's incoherent about that? How does the statement you should do X, what does that correspond to? Because you didn't you didn't answer that. You said it you said it's an entailment of some other correspondence fact, but the statement you should do X does not correspond to anything as far as I can tell. You just said what's well, an entailment of some other correspondence. I think what? it corresponds to now we're talking, I mean, remember we're talking about a moral statement. We're not talking, we're talking about a normative statement. So it's not going to be the same kind of correspondence that say uh, the statement, there is a tree that just sort of neatly corresponds to the fact that there's a tree out there uh, outside of my window. Um, normative facts are admittedly diff more difficult to.
describe how they correspond, but I'm happy to say that this, this normative statement corresponds to the nature of God. God's nature makes it such that we ought to do X, Y, and Z, whatever the case may be. And that is not incoherent. You might not agree, but it's not incoherent. Well, so you saying that these kinds of normative statements are a new kind of thing that is in no way analogous to like, there is a tree. I didn't say that. I didn't say no way analogous. I didn't say new kind of fact. I just said, this is said a perfectly different. coherent. I said there, it's more difficult to sort of work out, you know, kind of in an online discussion. But I spend a couple of weeks on this in my ethics class of talking about these facts these normative facts and how they, they uh, it, it's more difficult. Again, I, I, I grant that, but that's why ethics is so really interesting and, and that we ultimately do need something to ground the normativity of it. And I think that's grounded in the character of God. I, I think I would agree with the arguments from the non-cognitivists and the what, I forget the other ones, uh, but they say that you can't do that, and they have very good reasons why you can't do that, and those make but a lot of sense. You're not a non-cognitivist, right? You're a cognitive. I think you don't need that. You don't need the normativity. You can get rid of that and still have everything about it. And it seems very coherent the way I'm explaining it. Like it seems like yeah, like what, I'm what not saying it's honest? incoherent. I'm saying it's deeply troubling that we couldn't tell someone who is contemplating a horrendous act that they shouldn't that they ought not to do it why that seems what is to be a very important part of our human experience and our human lives that's what i do with my kids that's what i do with my students i i try to teach them what are the normative facts uh, of life in a way uh and that they ought to live by them well for me it's like if i'm comparing and those are all to... gibberish to you well, if I'm comparing two models of morality, one has the ability to tell other humans they should not do something, and one doesn't, like that that part seems kind of irrelevant. Like whether no or way. not, like if we think of any true theory of, I mean, of that's... knowledge of physics, the ability to tell other people they should do something is not is not relevant to truth in any it's other not context. The ability it, again, it, it, I mean, that's easy to say. <laughs> right it's easy to say but if if we have you know i mean man my goodness like to, to to think of all the people uh that have given their lives to a moral cause because they think that they ought to do that like that's some sort of you know should in their life this sort of moral imperative in their life that they ought to do this thing i mean and you're saying that's just gibberish no, there's it's still moral. What they did was moral, but the ought belief was a hypothetical imperative they implied on it. It's not hypothetical. I don't see the hypothetical bit. Well, hypothet if I want to be moral, I should do moral things. Hypothetical imperative. So that's the, there's the, you can still have the ought, but it's hypothetical, not categorical. So, but I'm not claiming it as a hypothetical. No, I am. So in my position, all of those people you mentioned who did right. things under the presupposition there was some ought statement did moral things. But the ought statement that they used to justify their actions was something they hypothetically applied from their own psychology, not like a thing that's intrinsic to morality in the universe. No, it seems to work just fine. But you, but you, that's now it doesn't sound like you are a moral realist. That if you're a moral realist, it wouldn't be just something in their own psychology. The oughts are not the morality is again the facts that correspond to the nature of morality. That's objective, independent of psychology. But the oughts are hypothetical. Like so, like you know, difference hypothetical versus categorical imperatives. Mm -hmm. Hypothetical are just are the psychology things subjectively people apply to what they want. Categorical I mean, is the objective. Not necessarily. I mean that that's not. Uh, it doesn't have to make them psychological to be hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. It's just an example, okay. but. So, so, but yeah, it's like the categorical imperative would be like the objective kind that you're talking about, whereas hypothetical would be more like the subjective kind that isn't really like a feature of reality. Right, right. But like Kant's uh, categorical imperative is a normative statement. Right. That would be the objective kind. The categorical is the objective kind. Right. But you, you think that's gibberish. Right. The hypothetical are the ones that I think are correct. So I think there are no categoricals. There are hypotheticals. Yeah, that's deeply troubling. <laughs> doesn't make sense but i think we've gone down like the rabbit hole of my 
pers my particular morality yeah enough. i wanted to go back to the um why would even if we granted that there was normativity why would you need a god for this why would a mind be a better explanation than a law of physics um i think that that just in my view um I mean, I guess putting it, I was going to say that, that best explains it, but that's not going to do a lot for you, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, well, why does it best explain it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. Um, I think the way I put it is maybe th that would resonate with you is that, um, right, physical laws as we experience them don't have normativity. So the law of gravity, for example, does not have normativity. It's, it's a descriptive claim uh that can be you know well worked out and and expressed but um it doesn't have normativity and i'm not sure that normativity as i reflect upon it makes any sense unless there's a mind that stands behind it when i think that i ought to follow the rules of say my institution or follow the rules of the you know state laws let's say or federal laws and so on um those have minds behind them. They're not, it's not like the physical laws, um, right? And so because those, the, they those have normativity and they have minds standing behind them, that gives me plausible analogy to saying that there's a divine mind that stands behind the moral laws. So are you saying that legal laws have the same kind of normativity? No. I'm just saying that they do have normativity. So by analogy, we can extend that to, and, and, and those are the creations of a human mind. Therefore, we can sort of, uh, by analogy, move to, I mean, again, I'm just saying, like when I reflect on it, normativity seems to make most sense as a property of a mind, um, a, a, you know, involving a mind, I guess I should say. Um, but I don't think you're going to like that statement or it's not going to be very persuasive and so to kind of use the way you've argued a few times where we look around at the world and we sort of see it see analogies and and make conclusions um the difference of a legal law and a say law of gravity or physical law um is there's no normativity with the physical law it doesn't right that's definitely you know when right. you conclude you know you ought to fall at a certain rate when you jump off a building or something like that doesn't make any sense um but when you say you ought to go the speed limit, it does make sense. And that normativity seems to be generated by uh, lawmakers. And well, so, so I would by agree. analogy, we can we can I think it's best the, the, the moral laws, so to speak, are best explained by a divine mind. Well, I partially agree there. I think that I would agree that the normativity we experience from legal laws would be an applicable analogy. But it seems like those are all subjective and so if you wanted to say there is an objective morality, we couldn't say it came from a mind because all of the mind-based normativity we have examples of are purely subjective. And so if you wanted an objective basis of morality, we'd have to say it's not normative or in the normativity that we see as a result of human minds. And it would be more plausibly a law of physics because those are more plausibly objective. And so if you want to keep the objectivity of morality, it's more plausible a law of physics and if you wanted to make an analogy to normativity, it would be more plausible to say that morality was purely subjective. No, I don't think so at all. I, I think that the, what the speed limit is on my interstate a few miles from here, it's just, a, you know, index to time T, you know, just call that now, is an objective fact. There's no subjectivity about that. There's no subject in view, in fact. It is just what the law is at this moment. It's an objective fact that it is 70 miles per hour to drive at, you know, December 19th, 1032 in the morning, Central Standard Time on Interstate 20. Well, the way I understand subjective is like mind dependent. So is that the case? No, if it's there not mind no dependent. Minds? It's not. No, that's not mind limit. dependent. That's not what we mean by mind dependent. Uh, mind dependent would be to say like it's it's uh, existing um, at a particular moment, <laughs> if you want to put it that way, like 
my pain, like if I were to smash my finger right now in my drawer or something, it's a little extreme, but uh, right, that, that pain would be subjective in a strict sense because it's dependent on my mind. And the moment, right, if my mind were to pass out of existence, then that pain would pass out of existence. That's mind dependent in a really robust sense. But the speed limits being what it is did not depend on any particular mind. Right were, at that time, T. They were, they were, they depend on a collective mind, a set of minds who all share the same mental idea. Because yeah. I, I don't think like so. when, when I think of objective, I think of something that's true. If all minds ceased to exist or didn't exist, it would still be true. That's and at time T, that would be true. Because uh, at time T, there were minds existing. And it, as it if there were no minds, objective. no minds. No mind. So if there are no minds, T plus one or something that where no minds exist. If no minds ever existed, if they all cease to exist, then at after that point, or if they didn't exist at that point, would it still be true? So when I think of the speed limit, that seems very mind dependent, very subjective, socially subjective. Um, it's, it's like the epitome of subjectivity. And no, it's something the that's epitome. the opposite of subjectivity would be no, of to me. The, the epitome would be where one, uh, like for morality, or, or for the for the speed limit to be subjective in the sense that I think you have in mind. And again, especially when you say the epitome of subjectivity, would be for me to be able to just choose my speed limit when I get on the interstate. It's just whatever I want to do at that particular moment, that's the speed limit for me. Uh, but what the speed limit is has objectivity to me. Now, there are other minds in, in the mix, and you're right that the, it is dependent socially in some ways, but that doesn't make it, therefore, a non-objective fact what the speed limit is at this particular moment. Does that make sense? So, like, I just don't think it has the subjectivity in the bad sense that you seem to be saying that it does to break the analogy between God. Now, if you're just saying that there's, there's a way in which this analogy breaks down, well, that's right. All analogies break down. That's why they're analogies, not literal identities. Um, so there are ways in which the traffic laws in the state of Texas are not like the moral laws. That's true enough, but it's not a mere subjectivity, especially not the epitome of subjectivity. Uh, in fact, for me, they are objective reality and I can, get on the interstate. I, I won't do this for the sake of your audience, but uh, right. I could get on the <laughs> interstate and show you that I will get a ticket if I do it long enough and fast enough. That would be great. I get a lot of views. Please do that. <laughs> but so like when I'm thinking of your analogy, your analogy was that if we look at laws written by legal institutions, they have normativity. And when we look at our intuitions of morality, they have normativity. Therefore, the laws of our intuitions must be governed by some kind of similar agent-based normativity. And I'm looking at our moral, moral feelings and I'm thinking these seem objective. Feeling and by more. objective, I mean true independent of any opinion ever. Like if there was no mind, it would still be the case kind of a thing. That's what Yeah, but I that's trivially feel. the case. I mean, now you're just ruling minds out of the picture. I mean, the whole argument is to say that there's a mind that stands behind normativity. And so if you're then taking minds completely out of the picture, well, trivially that follows. You know what I'm saying? That, But I'm saying I, there has to be mind in the picture somewhere in order to make the argument even get off the ground. I'm saying that a mind stands behind normativity. I think normativity makes best sense when grounded in a mind. Um, at, at, you know, again, sort of like, you know, dialing it back to, you know, so that legal laws are the product of human minds that gives us a sense of, of normativity that we ought to follow this. It is an objective fact that gives us an analogy to say that the moral laws also come from uh, a divine mind. So, or at least so something would... that that makes sense of them their their being normative their um sort of um being binding on us well we can just grant god exists for the sake of the argument here the point is that if we look at morality i think morality is true independent of any opinion including god's i think it makes more sense that yep. morality has this feature to it that it's unchanging it's yep. not contingent on opinion therefore it could be grounded in god's nature and his opinions have no effect on it whatsoever. His conscience has no effect on it whatsoever. He's determined by his nature such that he can't change the moral facts. They are a feature of reality that are 
independent of his mind. Still God exists, still he's the grounds of objective morality. And that would seem to make more sense of the fact that there is this objective mind independently objective fact of morality. Um, and I think that feature of morality is uh, one of the things that we have to account for when we're looking for what could a, a potential basis of morality be. It should have this feature that it's not mind contingent. Because if it is, then it seems to make it subjective, which then it loses one of the important qualities of being morality, which is the same argument you're making about me giving up oughtness. Um, I think that because that is an important feature, that the unchangingness, the objective, independent of opinion feature of morality is a key feature of what we intuitively feel is moral. The thing that best corresponds to what could potentially provide that feature would be a non-conscious thing, God's nature or law of physics or something. And if you are making an argument that the normativity aspect is best explained by a mind feature, those two seem to be in conflict. And I would say that the more important one is the nature one. And that this, if you're making a comparison to human laws, which are determined by minds and the determined by mind factor gives them the normativity, it seems like subjectivity is baked into that view of morality. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I think there's just different notions of subjectivity at work here. Um, sure. And I don't think that, you know, because there's a, there's a sort of quite literal sense of subjectivity, which is just relative to a subject that may not be subject, subjectivity in the bad sense at, at all. And so I think at the end of the day, what I'd be committed to say is that whatever subjectivity attaches in some sense or other to the laws of the land, uh, speed limit laws and so on, is, is not a bad sense of subjectivity. And maybe it, it is parallel in a way to God, the subjectivity of morality as it relates to God, but it's not, it's, there's still a perfectly good sense. And the, and the in fact, the sense that I think we um, typically talk about that the moral laws are objective, even if there's some sense in which they're subjective. I don't think that that's like, the, if they're relative to the subject of God, like that's not the bad sense of subjectivity. For me, whether or not I should drown the baby or whether or not I should cheat on the exam, it's still an objective fact of reality that um, I should not. And similarly, again, analogously, uh, whether or not I should go, you know, 120 on the interstate on the ride home tonight, um, you know, that's an objective feature of the world that I should not. Well, I think the the bad aspect of subjectivity is the is it's contingent on opinion, like the one yeah. the examples atheists always use. Well, what if God said drowning babies is moral? Would it be moral kind of right. thing? And if it was moral, if God decided that, then that would make it subjective, and that would make it the arbitrary thing. Right, that's not my We view. don't want that. Right, and so the kind of good objectivity that we want is the kind where this is completely independent of any opinion God could ever have. His opinions cannot affect it. It is completely separate from his opinions. It's, he can't change it. Doesn't, it doesn't matter what he wants. He can't change it mm -hmm. kind of a thing, which would seem to me fit more of the definition of mind independent, like it was grounded in his nature, independent of his choices altogether. Mm -hmm. And that seems like to fit that kind of objective definition, laws of physics work really well. God's nature works really well. Anything related to consciousness seems to work really badly. Except that you don't get normativity from the laws of physics. Yes. Right. It, which is, I think, just where we part company. But that's where I think I would, you know, I'm sure you've thought lots about this and, and come to this view as a, as a result. But um, just for, for your audience sake, I guess, in a way, just to say like that, that to me is a really big cost. I, I would be, you know, I would be very hesitant to ever bite that bullet for the whole reason of moral education and, and what I want people to, as they reflect upon moral values and facts, like what I want them to do with it. And again, it's not just what I want. It's, it's the sort of society that we want. And I, and I kind of just don't think for most of us, when we were asked the question, how ought we to live? Like we would just say, Hey, you're just talking gibberish. I just don't, I don't, I find that to be really troubling and, and just really implausible that we wouldn't, uh, have some views about that 
and and again, but it's you know that's fine. I, I just think that's probably where we part company. Um, th this is this is us parting company, by the way. Uh, right, that's where we part company, and that we, you know, you think, and and so, but I think we're agreed to say, uh, you don't get normativity out of naturalism, or out of at least that version of naturalism. Right. And to me, that's a huge cost. And so if anybody does think you have normativity and, and maybe tell me what you think about this, if you do have normativity, do you think then something like a divine mind uh, makes good sense of the normativity? Well, I'd still go with the moral naturalism version, one of the ones that do have normativity or uh, one of the versions of God that doesn't entail his mind at all. It's just his nature kind of a thing and his mind is irrelevant. So I would not, I would, I think that any, version that wants to keep the objectivity of morality can't have it be contingent on opinion in any sense and so yeah yeah sorry keep going well i'd say that god's consciousness can play no role in morality whatsoever and i i think there's probably and i probably wasn't careful enough when i described the view i i do think it's dependent on the nature of god um i i was using mind in a in the broadest of senses to mean you know soul or you know the divine being or something to that effect um so that it's not god's opinions that that generate the normativity it's it's his it's the divine character really is how i'd want to put it um that the divine character sort of sets that standard uh of moral facts like that is the that's what we're after obviously with a uh um normativity we're after the norm or the standard um and God's character sets that standard such that we there thereby have, you know, normative uh, normative claims that that uh, are binding to us as as rational human agents. Gotcha. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Yeah, Tim okay. West, question: Objectively, whose haircut is more moral, T. Jumps or Travis's? Is Ooh. the height of T. Jumps hair more moral, or the neatness of Travis's hair more moral? <laughs> That's a question for me to answer. It's for, it's for both of us, I imagine. Okay. Well, what do you think? I think um, he who has the best chair is the most moral, and I therefore win. There you go. I, I'm good with that one. Uh, as right. long as a back scratcher is within reach. Um, next question was: Is Ken from Good Question? Can God change his mind? Um. I think that the answer to that in a really substantial sense is no. Um, it, especially if what we mean by that is that God can be sort of unsure of, right? I think his, um, his divine omniscience entails that he knows, you know, all the available options and sort of knows by virtue of his character, which is the, um, I hesitate to say, but, you know, I think I have to say something like the best course of action and knows that from all eternity or something to that effect. And so there's really no sense in which he's changing his mind and, and especially no sense if that means that he's unsure or doesn't know various facts, um, you know, before they happen on my view. But there's plenty of people that would say, yeah, plenty of Christians. I, I don't think that's a I think that's a debate for you know sort of amongst christians of just where they come out and it's especially entailed by i think what view they you know kind of how strong of a view of god they have if god is divinely omniscient or if god and, and then it also uh, a sort of open theist that would say like god knows everything there is to know but doesn't know what the you know free agent will do in the future and so in some sense, changes his mind depending on what the decisions of the free creatures do, and so on. So there's there's plenty of views there. My own view would be to say no, not not really. Gotcha. Uh, Winston's mom asks, uh, "Do you find Islam to be a moral religion, and do you believe Christianity is more moral than other religions?" <laughs> That's not contentious at all. Um, do I find it? I, I think there are versions of it, but I, I think there would be no. Uh, doubt that there are immoral versions of Islam, just as I would be quick to add that there are no, there's no doubt that there are immoral versions of Christianity too. I mean, so it kind of depends what we mean by this. Um, now, and again, I'll let the the Muslim, you know, defend 
their their religion i i am troubled by you know some of the things that i see in the quran um like kill the infidel wherever you find them and those types of things but plenty of people are troubled by various passages in the old testament other places but that's where i think the muslim needs to say like what does that mean in context and and def defend it and i think if it just means you know, the, the more uh, sort of extreme fundamentalist, uh, you know, versions, then I, then I am morally troubled. I think that's morally wrong. But same way I would go with the Christian who would look at the Old Testament and find cer certain passages, and those would be their life verses or something like that, um, you know, um, killing non-combatant, you know, people who are God's, not God's people or something to that effect. But I would, I would, want to have the opportunity to defend various passages in the old testament as well so yeah i think there's version i mean all, we're you know christianity really predicts this is that we're really uh you know good at getting things wrong um and we do a lot of really horrendous things and so uh you know a, as fallen creatures and so i think we can take any good thing and um make a mess of it gotcha native atheist thank you for the super chat Question for Travis: Did your God draw babies, and is that immoral? Um, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, yes and no. <laughs> um, God did cause the flood. Just clip that first part. And just yeah, that's right. Out. That's right. Please don't. Um, I don't think I, I. So this is a really good question and one for probably another day, um, because I, I I I'll just say this that I, that my biggest struggle. So again, not to plug my own book, but um, in the book, I, you know, in talking about doubts and things like that, uh, this is the one I probably struggle with the most is some passages that, that seem so extreme um, and where I come out on it. And again, it's going to be way too quick to do it justice, but is that, um, that God is not immoral, um, but God is also not, doesn't have the same kinds of uh, obligations that, that humans do. Um, and so that God as, and this is really consistent throughout scripture is that God is, you know, he certainly love and so on that the Bible is pretty clear about that, but he's also the, the judge of humanity and that God can judge humanity. And so that's part, I, I would see these old Testament passages of violence and, and bloodshed. And, you know, I think we just have to be honest of what's there. And again, this is probably going to cause the the stream here to blow up a little bit but um because uh, it's way too quick but um right i, th I think i read these as judgment passages and uh judgment is harsh and judgment is uh not fun but but these are that's that's where i would come out on it gotcha um thank you for the super chat cl <laughs> you're not you're not going to respond at all okay well okay. Th these are the questions so I yeah, yeah, yeah like if you do a back and forth in the questions i wouldn't have yeah, time yeah, yeah. to like do yeah. one of the other ones and yeah, yeah. they pay me i'm kind of like obligated to like i got gotcha. you hey tom you said it's probably consensus that an infinite regress is possible would love <coughs> to hear where you get that from that would be from the foundational attitudes of quantum mechanics uh from schlosshauser that is from the paper that shows that infinite regress is the consensus in physics mm. Next question is from Zap Brannigan. How does he justify the obviously immoral actions by Yahweh in the Bible and Yahweh is the grounding of morality? If he is, if Yahweh is grounding of morality. Same question pretty much. Yeah, same question. So same answer. It would just be to say that God um, is the judge. Um, and so I, I don't think, I, I wouldn't concede that, the, that these are obviously immoral. Um, extreme, yes troubling uh, i'll be honest yes um right but immoral at the end of the day i think i think what you have to do i or or for me the way i think of it is god if god is god if god is the greatest conceivable being which i think he is then it's difficult for us to understand of course the actions and and, and like we're not in a position to know i mean it's kind of a skeptical theist approach to it but uh, um whether or not god is, it's morally permissible for god to move in judgment on people even in harsh ways that seems to me to be plausible gotcha uh good question asks 
Uh, can a human law, human made law change while you are following it? Congress can change it right. Question. Yes. I think he's implying that that makes it subjective. And so the analogy that's why I indexed to... it to a time T and said gotcha. at a particular time, um, it just is what it is. Gotcha. Uh, next question is from Kanye Twitty. Is God capable of making a world where evil it was not needed? I think so. God is capable, right? But um, that would be a world without free creatures, though. Uh, so God could have created a world with um, just physical laws and 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 so on. But I think the I think it's God is not capable of creating a world in which there are free creatures who never go wrong um is inevitably that that, that a, a genuinely free person will eventually uh transgress the moral law gotcha. um next question is from good question again can god change a law while you are following example don't suffer wish to live and love your neighbor don't suffer a witch. Wait, the, the witch paragraphs about where you should um, stone witches and oh, the inspiration of the gotcha. witch things. And he's saying that that would be in conflict with uh, love thy neighbor. And so God can change the laws just like Congress can change the laws because he was the guy who asked about Congress. I see. Um, can God change a law? So I think God can change. Um, this is going to sound a little bit like a I'm fudging here, but I, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to. If it does sound like that, um, I think that there are like what our obligations are do change throughout the Bible. But I, I don't think that. Um, in other words, you know, the in the Old Testament, as some will know, that there were you know the whole Mosaic Law. There are plenty of things that we were, um, or I should say, God's people were obligated to do that in this, you know, sort of today, the view would be that we're not obligated to do it. I don't know that God has changed sort of the moral values there, um, right? But the exact expression of the, the moral obligation has changed. And so um, that, that can change. But I, I don't think that um, loving your neighbor is necessarily in conflict with. Um, I mean, I have to look at the passage uh, to not suffer a witch. I'm not sure. Um, what that is there. I, in fact, I'm just not familiar with it, but, um, but I think that loving your neighbor <laughs> can be consistent with that though. I'd have to do some work on it to make that consistent. It's uh, Exodus 22, 18. I think thou shalt yep. not suffer in which to live something along those lines. Um, next I'm not sure question. What that means. Don't suffer in which to live, kill witches. I think it means kill witches, but I don't think it may, I don't think it has to mean kill witches. Uh, System Lord asks, if we're deciding which religion is more moral, then aren't we telling religions what morality is instead of the opposite? Um, yeah, perhaps. But that's okay. I, I, for me, that's okay. Because, again, when we are... There's, there's, there's us having to uh, figure out what is morally right and morally wrong... And then we have to do the work of, um, right? Then we do the moral ontology work and so on. And that those, those are not necessarily the same, done in the same time or in the same, same pursuits, um, right? Aren't we telling religions what morally is instead of the opposite? Yeah, I, I don't think we get morality from religion necessarily. I think that morality is grounded in God, but um, I think that we... And the Bible is pretty clear about this, that the law is written on our hearts. Like we, we, we know what morality is separate from the Bible. And then I think, and, and religion, theological tradition. Um, and then we take that moral sense of, of things and evaluate religions. Gotcha. Um, next question is from Mr. E. Arthur. Can babies younger than two weeks old be deserving of drowning by God's judgment? 
Yeah, that's uh, that would be the hardest part about the flood. I think uh, the flood account. Um, I don't think so. My, my own view would be to say it doesn't that the the babies don't deserve to be drowned by God's judgment, but I still think that the whole event is a matter of God's judgment. And so, like I said, it's it's messy and it's um, it's not. Um, the question is, is God justified in, let's say, causing the the flood? Um, and I, I think I can see my way clear to say that God is justified in the flood. Um, what happens with the babies? I think, you know, on my own view, the babies would go to be with God for eternity. And, and that, in a way, justifies the action. So it's not a judgment of the babies, but it's still a the act uh, the overall act is a judgment act. Uh, Boo Boo Frick says, divine collateral damage, am I right? Um, mm. <laughs> Travis Statham, um, can you explain Christianity naturally? I think he means like uh, many apologists argue that the origin and growth of Christianity is better explained by supernatural intervention than natural causes. Can you explain the like resurrection story naturally? Um, I don't think you can well explain it. I don't, I don't know if that's the question. Um, like if there's a plausible explanation of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think you can. I think there are ways in which you can possibly explain it that would be natural uh, explanations. And that doesn't bother me at all to, to admit that. I just think, um, yeah, so you're right. that the, and If this is where the question's coming from, that some, some apologists... Uh, way overstate the case. Let's just be honest about that. Yeah, that would be a good one to talk about uh, maybe next time, Like, is, yeah. which is the more reasonable explanation of the resurrection story. Uh, Mr. Monster, thank you for the super chat. If Satan is under God's control and working for God and God already knows all the outcomes, how could Satan do anything without God's knowledge? Um, I think God does know. I think that... Um... I don't. So let's see. So is, is Satan under God's control? I would say in a sense, no, that that Satan is also a free creature um, and making decisions. So he's not directly under God's control. Um, I think there's a way in which God is still sovereign over all of reality. But I, I'm a libertarian about freedom. And I think that we make free choices. And I think that um, any genuine, you know, personal agent, of course, makes free choices. And so uh, in that sense, Satan's not under God's control in this view. Uh, how could Satan do anything? Yeah, but God knows. And that's that's one way to work out his sovereignty is that God knows what we will do as free creatures and our free decisions fit into the sovereignty of God and, and his divine plan for us. And same, I'd just say the same thing about Satan. Gotcha. Um, that's not the right one. <laughs> that's not a um, question can he exp oh no it's the same one I just read is using faith as an epistemology morally wrong considering Ooh. how unreliable it can be is using faith and epistemology morally wrong yes because I don't think faith is an epistemology I don't think it's a way of knowing I don't know if it's morally wrong I, that's probably a little overstated but I think it's I think that we shouldn't use faith. And of course, this all depends on what we mean by faith here, but we shouldn't use faith as a way of knowing. Um, I think that faith is a way of living. Uh, it's actions that we take in light of what we know. And so I place my faith in my wife, let's say, because I know certain things about her and you know she's proven herself trustworthy many, 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 many times. Um, and so I have good reason to place my faith in her. And I think a similar thing would, would go for God, um, that if as we come to know the world as his creation, you know, presuming we can come to know the world as his creation and believe that rationally, then at some point we ought to um, um, place our faith and, and, live, and live that way. Gotcha. Melody no, I, asked, and I make a, I make a real big deal about that with my students and with, with, um, you know, in print, even in the books, um, 
that faith should never be um, our, our epistemological way of knowing the world. Like that's a huge mistake that Christians make. Gotcha. Melody asked, why did God create Satan? Um, I don't know. Nice. Simple answer. Travis asks, how old is the earth and did we evolve? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely evolved. Um, and again, it sounds like I'm dodging here, but, um, but I genuinely don't know how old the earth is. Um, and, and again, this is more of an intramural debate amongst Christians probably in some ways, but um, I think the earth could be in the universe. Let's not just talk about the earth, but the, the universe could be very, very, very old, uh, you know, just as old as, you know, contemporary science says it is, or it, it could be young if you have, and this is just because I'm trying to be, you know, approach this um, as a theist. I mean, I think if you have God on your view, then like God could have created even five minutes ago. And so like, it's definitely possible that the earth is young. Um, and I genuinely don't know as, you know, coming from a Christian theological perspective, I don't know uh, what view I, I should hold there or what's the more pl plausible, rational view. Um, and I don't think it matters. I, I really don't think the Bible weighs in on the age of the earth. I think either those, the so-called old earth or young earth view, um, right? There's, there's good folks on both sides of that from my perspective. I think it's uh, 4.5 billion is the earth age right now consensus um mr monster thank you for the super chat if god knows satan is going to harm a bunch of people who are innocent maybe even before birth why doesn't god stop him why make humans wait yeah i think this is you know again one of those really difficult and big questions but i think it's the book of job in some ways and i think that god has plans and purposes um in these things that we are not privy to at times and so we can ask these kind of questions, um, but we just may not have good answers to them. I think, I think where, um, I think where Job comes out in a way is that he doesn't know why the things happened to him that did, um, but he has a much clearer and better view of God, and um, you know, um, in that way, like God did have a plan and a purpose through it, even though it was. Horrific for him. Gotcha. Um, Mr. Creonine asks, how can the Malachim, Malachim have free will and be merely messengers of his eminence? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, free will, I don't see why, be, and I'm not sure, sure what it's referring to, but um, having free will and being a messenger is not inconsistent. I think the Malachi refer to uh, the angels before the fall, including okay. Satan. And I think the point was that they're jealous of humans because humans have free will or something. That was like the difference between us and them, I think. But not an expert. Uh, the Pope of Atheism asks, so if God rolls a dice, does he know where they will land? How does that differ from creating Satan? Yeah, I think he does. So don't, don't play poker with God is one upshot of that, probably. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, of course he does. I, I, if, if you believe that God is omniscient, then, then God, you know, he knows, he knows what the role of dice would be. And then the question, how does that differ from creating Satan? I, I don't think that's a role of the dice. Um, I think that God knows all decisions of free creatures and sovereignly... Um, uh, is sovereign over that because those free he knows what they will do and creates a world in which his plans and his purposes are accomplished. Gotcha. Um, good question asks, can we repent of our sins in hell and be forgiven? If not, is God infinitely merciful and loving? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that Sorry, to, to which to one the of those? One. Yeah, to the first one. Um, I don't think so. Um, I have no reason to think so. Um, if not, is God infinitely merciful and loving? 
you know, I think there's another area in which I'm, I'm in process on is, is what to say about hell and, and kind of it's, um, it's, um, you know, what's the right way to think of it. And, and honestly, I don't think that the Bible is very clear on it. And, and so I'm okay saying, I, I don't know about a lot of these, honestly. Um, and so could God, could, is there a way to work out God's being merciful and loving and there be hell? Yeah, I think so. Um, if that's the question, um, I, I think it, it can be consistent with his uh, mercy and love. Now, the word infinite is one I'm I'm never super comfortable with because I think infinite means typically unending, and I don't know that God's properties are unending in in a real sense. Um, I think that God is I think the word maximal is better. I think God is maximally merciful and loving, um, but there's an end to those things, and so even with His knowledge. Um, no, it was his his power. Some somebody asked about his being able to um, something with Satan. I think um, anyway, and I said no, God's not able to. And I think somebody commented on the the stream like, "What God's not able to?" Yeah, like there's an end to God's power um, in the sense that He's not infinite in power in the in the unending sense. He's maximal in power. He can do all things that are logically possible and to control and constrain a genuinely free agent is not logically possible. And so God, I'm comfortable saying God cannot do that. Uh, the Pope of Atheism asks two questions. If we evolved, then where did original sin come from? And without original sin, why was Jesus' sacrifice necessary? Um. Yeah, I just think, you know, so we could have evolution. I mean, there's a whole host of views that I think um, affirm evolution and uh, and work in original sin. Um, it could be that um, God uh, had a kind of um, like evolution in the full scope of it is the case. And God chose a, a, a couple uh, call them Adam and Eve for the sake of the discussion and, you know, either gave them a human soul or, you know, something to that effect. These aren't views necessary. I hold to, but right. These are views that are out there. I think again, like a lot of these questions are kind of like, or at least the way I'm reading them is, is it possible to hold this and that? And I think, you know, yeah, it's possible. Are these, you know, the most plausible views at the end of the day? I don't know. That's just for everybody to sort of figure out. Um, but yeah, there would definitely be ways to work in original sin, it seems to me, with it. You know, so God choosing the couple and then they they sin and then that sin spread to their descendants and that sort of thing. I think that's a, a, a respectable view. And the second one was, is if there was no original sin, did you need Jesus? Yeah, I, I kind of think, uh, I think we at least, at least we've got textual problems. I think we have problems with say Romans five, where that's uh, pretty squarely affirmed. I mean, it's interesting, right? So like if we didn't have unoriginal sin, like a particular event that we call the original sin, um, maybe there's a way in which we could still be, you know, morally depraved or morally fallen or something to that effect that, that um, wherein Jesus is, you know, in a sense needed. Um, I think there's ways to work that up too, but yeah, I, I, I think I would agree. Who is it? The atheist Pope or something? Uh, both, I think of I would, both of atheism. Both of atheism. Um, I think I would agree that there's a sense in which if there is no original sin um, and we are not fallen. Now, again, that's pretty hypothetical because I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that, uh, we are quite fallen. It just takes turning on the evening news, uh, right. To sort of know that, um, we're pretty fallen, uh, creatures. And so, but if there was not a fall, then I don't know that there's a need for Jesus. Um, but I don't know that there could be free creatures, free moral agents that don't fall. I just, I don't find that plausible at all. 
Gotcha. Uh, we do have a lot of people saying thank you for coming on. It was a great show. Really appreciate okay. it. Uh, I did want to say thank you. I really do appreciate it. It was a great conversation. We have been going for about two hours. Do you yeah. want to give any links or references where people can find out more about your work? Yeah, sure. So my website is uh, just my my name, travisdickinson.com, and you can get links to, to books. And um, I do a little blogging there, not very consistent, but I try to try to blog somewhat regularly. Um, I do have a free book available there too on apologetics um, that somebody can download if they sign up for my newsletter. Uh, but yeah, that's probably the best place to find me, but the books can be found at all the, you know, Amazon and wherever else. So. Awesome. Uh, thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate yeah. it. And I hope you uh, have thanks. a wonderful well, rest of your day. Yeah. I, I had no idea that two in two hours and 15 minutes almost just went by. Yeah. That was crazy. <laughs> for sure. Time flies yeah, when so you're having good. fun, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Talk to you later.